This is part 11 of our series on nerve entrapments. The topic of this video will be an entrapment of the median nerve. In this video, I will cover the following, the function of the nerve, common locations of nerve entrapments, why this nerve entrapment occurs, clinical signs of this nerve entrapment, and lastly, how to effectively treat this nerve entrapment using both manual and instrument-based treatment methods. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Matt Maggio. I am a soft tissue injury treatment expert specifically for neck, shoulder, elbow, and wrist pain. My focus is on finding and fixing scar tissue and reducing inflammation from chronic injuries without the use of drugs, injections, or surgeries, which does lead to a significant increase in overall functioning, flexibility, and long-lasting pain relief. I am also the creator of the PEAK method and the founder of the Soft Tissue Treatment Revolution, where we teach overworked massage therapists a better treatment system that will allow you to cut your treatment times by at least 50% so you can stay healthy, avoid the dreaded burnout, and help a hell of a lot more people get out of pain. All right, Nerve Entrapments Part 11. If you haven't watched any of the other videos in the series, I'll link them up top. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're consuming this anywhere else, it'll be down in the description box below. Wanted to cover a very important nerve entrapment in the upper extremity, the median nerve. So let's get right into it. So first off, what is the function of the median nerve? It is both motor and sensory. Um, the first is motor function, which simply means that it helps move several different muscles in the forearm that control the motion, which is called flexion, and deep into the hand. It also does some sensory functions. Essentially, it gives the brain data about what is felt around the area, especially what is happening on the skin on the surface. It does sensory to the part of the palm as well, and the second to fourth fingers as well. So it is a mixed nerve, both motor and sensory. So where does it get stuck? The median nerve has a long way to go as it makes its way out. It actually starts up high, and it's composed of both the from the C6 all the way to the T1 nerve roots that come out in between the neck, where I commonly see most of those entrapments occurring is in the scalenes. I've covered this in other videos about how to treat the scalenes and know if they're a problem. I tend to see them more between the middle and the posterior scalene. That's where they get caught up the most, where there's a lot of friction and tension can happen as well. Next area where it does get caught is right on the front of the subscapularis where the brachial cords come in. Everything's kind of lined up differently. The median nerve is kind of dead center in there on the brachial cords. It gets stuck there as well. Then it makes its way down into the arm, into like the middle part of the arm. And the next spot it can get caught is into the pronator teres. And then it also can get caught in the flexor digitorum superficialis, which is just a little bit inferior and deeper to the pronator teres. And then the last spot it gets caught is down in the carpal tunnel, which is like a ligament and some fascia over there as well. So it has a long way to go from start to finish. And there's multiple places where the nerve can get entrapped throughout the entire course. So why does it get stuck? Number one is just poor and sustained posture. Over time, we overuse our muscles. We sit too much. We don't move enough. And the muscles are constantly contracted. They don't get enough blood flow. They don't get enough oxygen. The body starts to lay down immature collagen fibers, which in turn become scar tissue. Scar tissue is like glue that gets inside the muscle, makes it less flexible and weaker. Over time, that scar tissue gets bigger and bigger, and eventually it gets stuck to the nerve and presents with a nerve entrapment. You'll see like numbness, aching, burning, and tension. Another area I see median nerve problems is in repetitive use um, people, especially with their job and their occupation. Maybe they're like working on a factory line. Maybe they're like a mechanic or a handyman or something like that, where they're just constantly doing these weird motions with their elbow and their wrists and their hand. I see that a lot too, where those muscles can all get caught up, especially down like through that pronator teres and that flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, another one is just injury and trauma. They got hit directly on there. That can create some scar tissue and then that nerve can be compromised as well. And the last one is just issues from past surgeries. Maybe they had a fracture or a break and they went in there and cut through the muscle lays on that scar tissue, takes time eventually for that nerve to get entrapped as it goes. So some common injuries associated with an entrapment of the median nerve, we always want to look at clinical signs and a very important clinical sign of nerve entrapments is going to be numbness, aching, burning, and tension. Those are going to be really your history points of finding out 
what's going on. I covered this in the very first video in this training series, like what to look for in a clinical sign of a nerve entrapment. These really scream out to me, especially that numbness, aching, burning, and then some tension. I'm definitely thinking I have some type of nerve entrapment. And then it's going to really be where that nerve entrapment is happening. That's where that symptom location gives me an idea. The most common one known with the median nerve across the board is carpal tunnel syndrome. Everybody gets diagnosed with that. Anyone that basically has a problem from like the elbow down to the wrist and the hand, they're like, I got carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm like, well, there's a lot of nerves and a lot of muscles in there. It's not specifically that, but that's the junk box diagnosis that they give to a lot of clients and a lot of patients. I would say anything with syndrome in the diagnosis is really just a code word for, they don't really have a clue as what's going on. Also, we're going to see some pain and numbness and weakness in the forearm and the wrist and the fingers as well. They might have trouble with gripping, especially around there as well, because when the nerve is getting caught, remember I talked about the nerve is sensory and motor. So you're going to get that numbness and tingling. But if the nerve is compromised, it can't fire how it's supposed to. And it can in turn present with some motor weakness too, where they're having trouble with like fine motor skills and things like that and not able to use their deep um, intrinsic hand muscles as well. So how to effectively treat it? There's a lot going on with that median nerve. Like I said in the beginning, it has a long route to go from start to finish from where it goes. I would say nerves are built with like 15% of extra slack, like a rubber band to keep them healthy. They make their way around joints and muscles and fascia in there, and it can get caught in various different places. So one thing that I always like to look at, especially when I'm taking a full and detailed history, you should always be taking a full and detailed history, not just jumping right into treatment like, oh, it hurts here. It's like, I, I need to know a lot of other things. We cover a lot of that in some of our uh, free training courses, like getting to the root cause of what's going on and asking the right questions so you know exactly where the problem is, because if you don't know what it is in the first place, you sure as hell can't fix it. So I'm always trying to decide, do I want to start higher up in the scalenes or do I want to start lower down in the carpal tunnel? So one thing I do when I want to start higher up is usually if I'm getting like numbness or tingling, maybe into the forearm, into the wrist, into that median nerve distribution, but I don't really have a history of like neck or shoulder trauma, I'm probably going to start higher up because I think it's getting caught in there as well. Same thing. If there's like down low, if they haven't had like a direct um, injury to there as well, I'm going to start higher up as well. You know, so many people end up starting like down here where it is, but it's getting caught higher up there. And a lot of times the more distal symptoms that you feel throughout that nerve tension is coming from somewhere higher up. So if, Hey, they, they hammered that area and they, they jam their hand. I'm going to start down there. But most of the time, if there's no like direct trauma throughout the, the course of that, I'm going to start higher up and work my way down. Another thing that I'm going to see as well, if there is a big history of like neck and shoulder issues as well, I'm going to start up there as well, because that's where the nerve is going to get compromised the most. We tend to feel more of it down here. I kind of give it the analogy of like the kink in the hose, you know, where it's like sputtering at the end, but it's getting caught somewhere up higher. So, so many people and so many providers out there, they just start right down in the elbow and the wrist. So many people get these carpal tunnel release surgeries. Uh, they're paid for by the insurance. They can do it in an outpatient setting. Doesn't really do anything. They're like, yeah, I got carpal tunnel release, but my problem came back. I'm like, that's because they didn't check higher up. It's coming from higher up. Unless you had a direct trauma to the elbow or the wrist, I'm not thinking it's true carpal tunnel syndrome. It's coming from somewhere higher up. So when I start higher up, first I get into the nerve roots at the scalenes, cover this a lot in the treatments, basically all the way from C5 to T1 about treating in between the posterior and the middle scalene, getting proper depth and tension, holding that nerve back, forcing it to go through, but feeling that slide as well. It's not pin and stretch. Like I talk about, it's more like feeling that tissue slide as we go in there. Then the next where, spot we're going to go down and check is right on those brachial cords, um, at the subscapularis for this one, I only do manual treatment in that area because there's so much going on. You got the nerve roots, you got the blood vessels, you got all sorts of areas in there where it can be a problem. And that median nerve like kind of sits right on top of that subscap. So it can either get caught on the top part or the, the side or the middle. It just depends where you go in there. And I talked about like feeling for nerve entrapments when they're stuck, they don't kind of bow how they're supposed to. And it's real tender to the client as well. So next thing I'll do is I'll do some manual work on those brachial cords at the subscapularis. Then I work my way down. And next thing I get into is the pronator teres. 
And what I like to do first is I do some instrument work with that as well, um, just to get the top layer in there to free up some of that and, and, and open that up. Then I'm able to get in there manually and start to open that up. Next thing I like to treat is the flexor digitorum superficialis. That's a little deeper. It's pretty hard to get it with an instrument because instrument really only can go about half an inch or an inch deep. And that muscle tends to be deeper. So manual is going to be your best bet with that. And the last area where I clean it up is going to be right in that carpal tunnel. And the instrument work works really well getting in there and opening that up. But I'm not treating all of this in one visit. I'm like trying to figure out which is the worst. So say I have someone come in, they got carpal tunnel syndrome, they're presenting with all the history points of having a carpal tunnel problem. I'm like, all right, I think the median nerve is caught up. I do my functional evaluation. Maybe there's some limitations in the neck, the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist as well. I'm going to start up and maybe for one or two treatments, I'm only going to treat the scalenes and see how it does. Then if that improves, I'm going to continue to be there. If not, I'm going to work down to the brachial cords of the subscap do a couple of treatments on that, see if that improves. If it doesn't improve, two or three treatments, I'm going to work my way down into the pronator, into the flexor digitorum superficialis. If that doesn't improve or gets better, I'm going to stay there. And then lastly, I'm going to end at the carpal tunnel. I feel like just the medical society as a whole has this completely backwards. They're going down here and treating this area because that's where the effect is, but it's not the real cause. And if you're only treating the effect and you don't get to the root cause, you're never going to fix the problem. But this comes from a thorough history, knowing exactly what's going on, collecting data, slowing down. I'm trying to encourage everyone out there to be what I call a clinician first and a technician second. A lot of us as manual therapists, we don't want to take the time to do a functional evaluation to take a thorough history and know what's going on. We just throw a bunch of treatment at it. We really don't know what's going on and we don't know if we're getting like reproducible results. We're just kind of winging it every time and not getting to the root of what's going on. I want you to think critically and be a problem solver. So that's all I got for you guys on this video. Appreciate you guys watching. If you like the video, share it with other providers out there that are looking to do excellent work and want to fix problems. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye.